So I um, thought about an interesting phrase this um, week. It's as it were. Have you ever heard that? As it were. It means um, so to speak. Well, in a matter of speaking, sort of, as it were. So someone could say, I am a, as it were, a Cape Townian. When they're not born in Cape Town, they didn't necessarily grow up in Cape Town, but they've spent many years here where they kind of feel like this is my home, and so they can say, I'm a Cape Townian, as it were. So not exactly, but pretty much. You get the phrase? as it were. So you could say, um, I am a member of Cedars, or I am, as it were, a member of Cedars. <laughs> Some nervous laughter. <laughs> but when you are, as it were, a member of Cedars, it's kind of like you, you'd say this is the church that you're a part of, but you a member here on your terms, versus I'm coming to be a part of in a way where there's no question as to whether I'm a member here or not. I don't come on my terms. I come to serve. I come to love. I actually submit myself to the, the, the design of God and give of myself, whether that be in finances or in serving, in acts or whatever. But like you, you either are or you're not. But if you're not, you could quite easily put yourself under that banner of, I am, as it were, sort of, in a matter of speaking. I don't go anywhere else, so this is my church. Um, you'd never find an expectant mom saying, I'm, as it were, pregnant. Because the question is, can you be half pregnant? Can you be partially pregnant? I mean, you're either pregnant or you're not. So you could never say, I'm pregnant, as it were. It's a defined thing. And so, here's the question. Could you say, I'm a child of God, as it were? I mean, clearly not. But I suppose if you had to ask the question of someone else, hey, would you look at that guy? Would you say that that's a child of God? What would they say? Yeah. As it were. In a manner of speaking. Sort of. So we, we could be children of God by virtue of repentance and faith that we come into this relationship with God. But in terms of how we live our lives... Is it on display? Is it real? Or is it kind of like, well, we're not 100% sure. Well, kind of. Pretty much. And, and so this is quite a challenging thing. Because, you know, we could say for ourselves what we think, but it's also like by what other people would say that, you know, this answer to the question could be given. So, um... When, when Jesus calls us, he does not call us to a, as it were, Christianity. It's a radical call. It's a laying down of your life. There is a conversion that takes place where you, your status changes radically from being an enemy of God to being a child of God. There's no um, kind of like, well, partially or to an extent or in a manner of speaking, this conversion has happened. I mean, it either it's happened or it hasn't happened. And, and so when he calls us, he calls us to this radical shift from what we were before, as the Bible describes it, enemies of God, separated from his love, to becoming his children. And it's a very defined thing. And so Jesus calls us in a way where he says, follow me. Become a child of God. Become a follower of mine. Become a disciple. Be an as it is Christian. Not an as it were Christian. 
And I think he's given us this prayer, the Lord's Prayer, to safeguard us from becoming, as it were, Christians. To lead us and to strengthen us to live our lives in such a way that there's no doubt that we're a, as it is, Christian. We are children of God. It's a definite thing, and it's true for us in our lives, not just by objective truth as God sees us, but how we experience it and how it's true for everyone else. Christianity is not a private thing. If anyone says, I like to just, you know, serve God and worship Him in my private way, you know, it's between me and God, that's not how Christianity works. When you, be, when you are saved, when you are radically brought to faith and your status changes, you can't keep it secret. It goes on display. Wherever you are, the Spirit of God is with you. Wherever you are, there is something of the rhythms of heaven that is at work in you that makes it obvious to everyone around you you're different. And so my encouragement for today as we just covering some concluding remarks on the Lord's Prayer is that you will be encouraged to continue praying this prayer because as you do it, you are kept in a space where what is already true is on display for others. And you find a fullness in your life where it's not like, well, we're not really sure, we, we hope so, we, we, we think, in a manner of speaking, it is sure as it is. As it is in heaven, you're a child of God if you've come to faith. But if it's true in heaven, may it be true on earth as well. Not that it's not true on earth, but the display of it, the, the experience of it, as it is. As God sees me, let me live my life. And so there's a couple of things that I want to cover, time permitting. The accessibility of the Lord's Prayer, the framework of the prayer, the basis for praying it, and the outcome of praying it. So let's read um, the text from Matthew 6. When you pray, you are not to be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they may be seen by men. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. But you, when you pray, go into your inner room, close your door, and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you are praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do, for they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. So do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then in this way, Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So, firstly, the accessibility of the Lord's Prayer. Now, we, we've kind of spoken around the, the structure of the prayer, that it's this chiasm. Um, there, there's some technicalities there, but one of the key things that really stands out to me is the shortness of it. It's just seven sentences. Now, I have said that it's a pattern, and, and it's a pattern that we could use, that we could add things to. But it's just seven sentences, and we don't have to pray more than that. What we are given here by Jesus is few words, but very powerful words. You know, what, what's actually really important is our understanding of what we're praying and our heart that we are praying it with. I mean, it's in the text that we read, it's been made quite clear that many words don't get God's attention. These words do. And so it's accessible because it's seven sentences. 
and um, most people know it. If you've kind of grown up in a Christian school um, or in a Christian environment, the Lord's Prayer has been said enough for you to know it, that you know it off by heart, but it's short enough for you to lay hold of, and it's very clear and it's very straightforward. There's no mysteries. There's no mysteries about, like, what is it that we're actually saying? What is this actually doing? I mean, the, the first three petitions, God's name, God's kingdom, God's will. The other half, our provision, our pardon, our protection. It's not that hard. It's not mysterious. It's not like, well, what are we actually saying here? We're praying into God's name, that His name would be made holy and hallowed, His kingdom advancing, His will being done. God's name, His kingdom, His will. Our provision, daily bread, our pardon, forgive us as we forgive others, and protection. Lead us not in a way that we'd be permitted to a place where our trials would become tragedy, but that it would rather authenticate our faith and turn into triumph as we live for you, that you would lead us this is in this incredible way. So it, it's really simple. And, and if you're here for the first time and you've missed the series that is online, and I would encourage you to, even if you have been here, to go back and listen to it again. You, you, we've got to feed ourselves with what these phrases, what these sentences are about in such a way that when we pray it, we have this heart and understanding of what we're praying, but we don't need meaningless repetition. It's the very words that Jesus used, like, don't go there. You don't have to. It's short. The words are few, but man, they're powerful. It's exactly what you need. And everything carries meaning in this prayer. So the other thing that we see is that it um, starts with our Father, Abba Father. And so Jesus is a, he's a groundbreaking innovator. He brings new things. I mean, all of his ministry was that. You know, his, his kingdom ways, the thoughts, the, the, the kingdom culture that he installed, it was, it was confronting what was. It was changing what was. And when it comes to prayer, I mean, we don't know what was there before. Well, most of us wouldn't. But um, we would certainly not know it in terms of experience. We would not know it in terms of being like, this is the, the prayer that we used to pray, and now Jesus is giving us a new prayer. Because the prayer that they used to pray as Jewish men was um, the, the tefillah. And, and that was 18 petitions. So already we've gone from 18 to 6. Jesus goes from 18 and, and, he, and he brings it down to a third of that. But, but man, he's covering the things that need to be covered. And, and so he makes it shorter. It was also something that was preceded. I mean, the, the more pious guys, the, the holy guys, they would stand for an hour. Stand before God. Not saying a word before they would start these 18 petitions, before they would pray their prayer. And, and so others would kind of feel like, ah, oh, I guess I need to do the same. But man, that's long. That's tiring. How am I going to stand for an hour? But they would stand for an hour before they even started praying. And it was about like trying to get yourself in a place where you were in some way or form worthy to pray these petitions. Because they were approaching God, and so I'll just stand here for an hour. So their petitions, their prayer, started with one hour of standing silence. The prayer that Jesus gives just starts with, Our Father. And you can go straight into that. You know why? Because you're not, you're not needing to get yourself into a place where you are worthy to approach God. It's already been done. So when you are a child of God, that worth has been credited to you. You have found worth because you are in Christ. You don't approach the Father because you're amazing. You approach the Father because He's amazing, and because Jesus is amazing. And it's in His worth that you can come into this presence of God with such confidence and such boldness 
and approach Him intimately, even though He is majestic in every way. And so, some of the other changes are around things like praying for forgiveness, because the Tefillah was like, we pray for forgiveness, but that's where it ended. Here Jesus talks about asking for forgiveness, but He connects it to forgiving others, which means He's talking about a whole new way of being forgiven. Because you're not forgiven by penitence or sacrifice or doing some things to kind of make yourself like I'm good in God's eyes. You are good in God's eyes because you have been saved by His mighty saving power and His Spirit is in you. There's a supernatural work and enabling in you that not only allows you to come to the Father knowing that the answer is going to be yes because He has forgiven you, but that you can through fellowship with Him always make sure that this fellowship is unbroken and that he is, he is one who is always going to say yes because the answer is yes from the start. You are forgiven. So you are a member of this family, but, but I want to make sure that when there's sin in your life that you have a confidence to come to me, bear it before me, and ask me to forgive you because you know the answer is already yes. So fellowship forgiveness is being restored here and in such a way that there's this amazing um, power that's in you that allows you to forgive others. So it's groundbreaking because now you realize I'm praying this prayer not in my worth or in my ability. I'm praying it in His ability and His leading. Do you see how much more accessible this is? That you can actually pray to God because He is with you and His Spirit is enabling you. The prayer of the Tefala was very much around the good of Jerusalem. And now Jesus says, on earth as it is in heaven. You see, Jesus is going global. It's not just about Jerusalem. It's the ends of the earth, which means it's not just a group of people. It's all people, all races. And the other thing that happened is that this tefillah was prayed in Hebrew, just like the reading of Scripture was in Hebrew. And the reason why that was done is because Hebrew was a sacred language. So if you didn't know Hebrew, you wouldn't be able to pray it. And you wouldn't be able to read Scripture. And so Jesus comes and he gives them a prayer in Aramaic, saying, you don't need a sacred language. You just need a language of the heart. I mean, that opened up the door for the entire New Testament to be written in Greek. You ever thought about that? Up until then, Hebrew, 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 sacred language, sacred language. It's just for the select few, yeah? Sacred language. And Jesus says, no, I'm going to give you a prayer in Aramaic. I'm opening up the doors, making it possible for anyone who comes to faith to pray this prayer. So it's not demanding. It's not a prayer that's demanding of our our time. He doesn't say when we must pray it. He structures the prayer in such a way that even give us this day, it's this coming day. So if you pray in the morning, it's the day ahead of you. If you pray it in the evening, it's the next day. Whenever you want to pray it. You you can pray it multiple times in the day. It's not like morning, afternoon, and evening, you know, like these specific times. He, He gives us freedom. He encourages us to do it, but He gives us freedom in it. And it's short, but it's powerful. And so we don't need to set aside an hour of silence plus then another half an hour of petitions, much shorter time, way more accessible. We need to understand that when we pray it, even though it's short, that it's powerful and it has meaning. Because we would pray it way more if we realize that. If we have a notion that prayer is this like long, drawn-out thing, well then, who's going to do it? Who has time for it? Plus, it's not the select group I found this picture of a whole bunch of Jewish men. You know, so like, that's what it looked like. That's who could pray. Now, you're not seeing what I'm seeing, but I'm telling you now, I am seeing different colors, different ages, men and women, from different backgrounds, different races, different cultures, just in this room. So you don't need to be a select type of person of the Jewish nation, male, 
and holy or, or, or some form of self-righteousness before you can pray. You just come as you are because your worth is in Jesus, and it doesn't matter who you are. He's opening it up. An incredible, accessible prayer for everyone to pray, everyone who's come to faith. He doesn't give this prayer to people who don't know him. He gives this prayer, this prayer to his disciples. But anyone can come. The doors are wide open. That's beautiful. So if you say, oh, we are, as it were, grafted into the people of God. No, it's true that we're grafted in. But if you view it in a way that, like, you, we were like this afterthought, you know. It was like, there's the people of God and, and, and Israel, and, you know, like, there's the importance. And, and we've just, like, been pushed in, you know, by God's grace. Thank, thank God that we, we can also be, no, that's not true. It's not as, as it were grafted in, as it is we've been adopted into his family. We have equal standing. Anyone who comes into the presence of God through Jesus has equal standing. It doesn't matter if you are male or female, Jew or Gentile. We read about it in Galatians. Slave or free. It doesn't matter your background. You could be this paragon of virtue an upstanding civil servant, or you can be a convict serving a life sentence. If you come to faith, you pray, our Father. You see how beautiful this is? Like Jesus is not trying to find this, okay, I'm just looking for these guys that looks a certain way. You know, we sometimes live our lives as we, we, we look to others and we compare, and it's like, well, oh, I don't really know, man. No, stop looking at yourself and stop looking at others. The only person that you need to look to is Jesus. He is where you find your worth. And as long as you're looking to Him, you can come into the presence of God and pray, Our Father, because that's how you find your worth. He makes you worthy. He gives you righteousness that He bought. Forgiveness, righteousness, He sets things right. He puts you in a place where you are in right standing with God. You don't need to make your way to a point of like, well, now I'm able to pray. Now I'm fit for the Father. No, He makes you fit for the Father. That's His work. And so we get to be a very inclusive, with amazing diversity. Doesn't matter your background. Doesn't matter your current standing. Doesn't matter your social status. Doesn't matter if you're intelligent or not. This is a prayer that people who don't even have intelligence, you know, it's not like this academic approach. It's God's name. It's His kingdom. It's His will. Our provision, our pardon, our protection. Very simple. And so He makes it accessible. The, um, the second thing is the framework of the Lord's Prayer. We've said it that it's God-centered from start to finish. So in praying, Our Father, we are leaning into His heart. Hallowed be Your name. We are revering and reflecting his name. So we come with reverence, but that reverence comes through a revelation of who he is, and revelation brings about transformation and transformation demonstration. So we're not just asking that his name would be revered in the circles that we are walking, but through our lives, his name would be revered. We are desiring his reign as we pray, your kingdom come. Your will be done, we're submitting to his purpose Daily bread, we're depending on His provision. Forgive us, we're living upon His mercy. Relying on His protection comes through praying, lead us not into temptation. And yours is the kingdom, we're resting in His glory. His heart, His name, His reign, His purpose, His provision, His mercy, His protection, His glory. It's God-centered from start to finish. Now, you might say, well, why does it have to be God-centered? Does God need this prayer? No, He doesn't need it. We need it. We're the ones that need it. But our need is met when we're God-centered, not self-centered. So when we look to Him and we pray to Him and we allow the prayer to be God-centered, we're better off for it. How does that happen, you might ask? I'm about to tell you. <laughs> By leaning into His heart... Our identity is affirmed. 
Man, this, this is probably the thing that people in this world struggle with. Even people in the church. We shouldn't be struggling with it, but we do. But a sense of validation, who I am, affection, am I loved, affirmation, there's someone who's pleased with me in what I do and how I do it. I mean, those are the three needs, validation, affection, affirmation. Those are the things we want. That's what we go and look for from others. I mean, if you do something that is of some form of noting, is there something in you that's just hoping someone will say, hey, well done with that thing, right? It's in us. We want that. A lack of identity, a lack of knowing who we are is what is giving rise to this ridiculous wave of, I'm not even going to go there. Because people don't know who they are. And it's all based on how I feel. No, it's not based on how you feel. You were created. You were made in the image of God. And when he draws you, he makes you his child. No questions asked. No doubt about it. But when you pray, our Father, your identity is being affirmed in the same way that Jesus, when he was baptized and he came out of the water, the voice from heaven, the Father over him said, you are my son, whom I love. In you I'm well pleased. Before Jesus had done anything. And now we are in Christ which means those same words come from heaven over us because we are children of God. We are in Christ. He is in us. You are sons and daughters of the Most High because of your faith, because you have been brought into this place. You are sons and daughters. You are loved by Him. Because I'm lovable? No, because of Jesus. He is pleased with you. Why? Because I did a whole bunch of good things and got involved with a charity? No, he's pleased with you because of Jesus. All of those things are answered in the first line. And we would do well to just stay there and allow the Spirit of God to minister to us that when we walk out of our inner room, having prayed this, we are secure people. We are strong in God, not in ourselves. We have a front-footed confidence because our identity has been affirmed. We don't do that. We're going to go and look everywhere, everywhere else for validation. You can't validate yourself. So who are you looking to? It can only come from Him. It can only come from a place of being in His presence. It can only come from praying the prayer that He gave us. By revering and reflecting his name, our purity is ensued. I mean, Isaiah said it, like when he saw the holiness of God, when he he entered the temple, the train of his robe filled the temple, what he was conscious of was the holiness of God and his sinfulness. And so God saves us and he allows us to come into his presence and come into his family as we are. But he is not wanting to leave us in that way. He changes us. He grows us. He transforms us. He makes us more and more in the likeness of Christ. So when we are in his presence and when we are seeing his holiness, something happens in us where we start to become more upset about the sin in the world and the sin in our own lives. But when you just live your life and compromise kicks in and everyone's doing it, well, you know, what, what's going to come and confront you with these things? There's only one thing, holiness of God. And so by praying His holiness and desiring His name, which is holy, to be hallowed, it brings us into a place where the sanctifying work of God, the purity that He will wash us with, starts to work in us that sins become less and less of a reality in our lives. 
when we desire His reign, we discover our calling. Not life calling. Day to day. Pray daily and you'll start to see how God will lead you and prompt you. And there'll be certain things that He'll bring to mind and prompt you for. And it's like, well, now I'm living in the calling of God. I think we put way too much on this, like the long-term, what is my, you know, big capital C calling. When you live it day to day, it will start to unfold. And a daily prayer allows that to happen. By submitting to His purpose, we grow in our trusting. And it's progressive, right? We can trust God. The, the, the things that happen in our lives, when we come onto the other side of being His child, we're faced with things where we need to trust Him. And when we trust Him with certain things that's smaller, He grows us in a way that as we grow, we can trust Him with bigger things. So we saw it with the Israelites. They came out of Egypt, and the first battle that they faced was with the Egyptians chasing them and, and the parting of the Red Sea. And God said, just stand back and watch. I'll do everything. But that faith gave them what they needed, where later on they're facing enemy again, and Joshua is leading that campaign, and we've got Moses on the hill, and his arms are being left, lifted into the air, and as long as his arms are in the air by Aaron and her, like they're winning. But now all of a sudden they're fighting. But that trust, that faith, was built on a faith that was established before that. So there's this ongoing trust. We're growing in trust because we're submitting to His will. And as we pray, your will be done. We're, we've, we're confronted with those things in our lives where we do surrender our own will. And we allow God's will in our lives. He leads us in it. And, and as He does that, we realize, oh, that, that was better than what I thought. Like He's doing something amazing here that carries eternal significance. I was going with what I thought was good for me in the moment, but actually, this is so much better. And then when the next thing comes, and His will comes into your life, and you're like, your will be done, but now it's bigger, well, you can look back on what went before and say, well, because he, He's shown Himself there, I can continue to trust Him. Do you see how when we pray this prayer, it's for our benefit? We're not coming just with our little petitions praying about ourselves, we're praying to Him, we're making it about Him, and as we do, we're better off for it. The framework of this prayer mirrors the framework of salvation. So if you take those things there, you see how the three that's now being highlighted, identity, purity, destiny, that's a mirror of salvation, right? So when you put your faith in Christ... He changes who you are. He gives you a new identity. You are made a new creation. You are born of God. But because you have now been born of God, He starts to work in your life where you are being transformed from one degree of glory to the next. We're not talking about saving faith now. Saving faith happened when you come to faith. Like when you put your faith in, that's saving faith. We're not talking about achieving faith. There is something that happens where we, we look back on our lives and we say, the person that I am today is not the same person than when I first got saved. And, and somehow when people come to faith, we have this judgmental view where we're like, yeah, but why is that person still smoking? You know, when, when, I, when I heard them speak the other day, I was like, oh, some bad language coming out of that person. Because, you know, we've potentially progressed but they've just come to faith. You know, sometimes God does a miraculous thing where He takes away your craving to smoke. But sometimes He doesn't do that. Your salvation is not because you, you, you've conquered an addiction. Your salvation is because you've come to faith. You put your faith in Jesus. And then He starts to work. The purity is an unfolding thing. It's a transformational thing. It's a different story if the person's been saved for 40 years and they're still using bad language and their lives is just not translating to anything. Then they're like, as it were, Christians. But, but I mean, if the Spirit of God is at work in us and we're responding to Him, well, then we are becoming more and more like Jesus. 
that's the outcome. I mean, when we get to heaven, we'll be like him. We'll be perfect. The question is, how big is the jump going to be from when you end this life to? And the, the destiny that's lying ahead of us will, will be perfect in glory. I just said it. And that will be the result of saving faith and achieving faith. And so we're perfect in glory with Him, and those are the three stages. So the very prayer that we are praying in the Lord's Prayer is a mirror of the framework of our salvation. And it starts with identity. And we focused on His glory, His kingdom, His power, which gives us this eternal view. So our destiny, like the, the temporal pools of this world becomes way less important when we understand the glory of that which is eternal. And, and so John, in 1 John 3, where he says, dear friends, now we are children of God, that's identity, and what we will be has not yet been made known, but we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like Him, that's destiny, for we shall see Him as He is, all who have this hope in Him purify themselves just as he is pure. So, John says, you have an identity when you come to faith. Because you've come to faith, there is a destiny where you'll be perfect in glory, and when you put your hope in those two things, you purify yourself as an inevitable consequence of the hope, which means you don't go to purifying yourself directly. You come at sanctification indirectly. If you go at it directly, you become legalistic and self-righteous. And those aren't nice people. Because you just land up being bitter with the world. But when your hope is in the work of Jesus on the cross, and that He has given me a new identity, and that that is secure, I'm saved in eternity. And that this life, doesn't matter what it brings me, I will be perfect in glory forever. When you have that hope, you live differently as a result. So identity and destiny is your motivation for purity. So when Scripture talks about work out your salvation, that's the six petitions between identity and destiny. Our entire prayer is bracketed by these two beautiful things where our identity is affirmed in the first line and our destiny is, we're reminded of in the last line. And in between those things, we are actually just working out our salvation by praying these beautiful elements of our Christian walk with God. Matters of discipleship and stewardship and worship. We're working it out. You know, so you might ask, well, how do you work out your salvation practically? Start praying and you'll see it will happen. Because when your hope is in your identity and your destiny, how you live flows from there. And if we're not reminded of our identity, and we're not daily being given a glimpse of what's to come, well, then we're going to live within the context of temporal circumstances. It's just how it is. To get yourself out of what is around you and what's happening around you and even the immediate future. Ooh, what's happening with the country? and uh, Whatever, man. Get a view of eternity. Get, a, get a, a, a revelation of who you are in God. Pray our Father and just, like if there was any, any time to just be silent. It's not before you pray. It's when you start to pray and you just say, Our oh, Father... And you just wait there. Let the Spirit of God testify with your spirit. You are children of God. He testifies with you in a way that you can cry out, Abba Father. And when you do, you live your life differently. <laughs>